Welcome to the Tesla Power Podcast, the unofficial energy community covering solar panels, solar roof, and power wall for your home. I'm Aaron Brady. Today, let's talk about why I'm a dummy and how you can avoid being one yourself. Let's talk about Australian time of use tariffs, and let's talk about Pura, what it stands for, and why the additional power wall matters. Let's do it. We get to start this pod with an excellent question. Why am I a dummy? Well, if you ask the creative director why, she'll have two oddly specific things on her list that she'll rattle off before you finish asking the question. But if you have something you want to ask, leave a comment below. We can either contact, um, or you can either leave a comment below, or you can go to teslapowerpodcast at gmail.com. Let's do some comments. Randy Hawkins puts his uh, question a little more delicately. Quote, Aaron, thanks for the informative and entertaining podcast. This week you told us at about 7 minutes, 35 seconds, don't be a dummy like me, and to check out your last podcast for more info. Now, I listened to the episode 12 again, but no love. Can you please provide a more specific reference to your mea culpa explanation? Thanks again. End quote. Randy, thank you for the question, and I'm happy to clarify. I had originally customized my home energy gateway to run in self-powered mode. Now, if we bring up the Tesla app, we can see um, it's this selection right here. We're going to go into uh, customize, self-powered. I already have it uh, selected now, which was actually a mistake. <laughs> I didn't mean to leave it there. Um, but you'll see the subtext, use stored power to power your home after the sun goes down. That sounds great. I want to use my solar power, right? seems like it's better right, to keep my power and use it later than it would be to send that electricity back to the grid for some other Jamoke to be using my rays for his electric toenail clipper. If you click learn more in the app, you get this really sweet sound and paragraph at the end of the, the detail. This mode approximately doubles the amount of solar energy that powers your home, and it's the best way to reduce your carbon footprint and be more energy independent, end quote. That's a lot of ands in that run-on sentence, but it really got me feeling the warm fuzzies right about there. Now, I want to double my storage usage. I like the idea of lowering my carbon footprint. I mean, I'm definitely the guy that should be more energy independent. No one tells Mr. Sunshine he has to take electricity from the government. Here's a huge problem with this, though. If I'm not sending electricity back to the grid... I'm not getting credit for my solar production, which means I net less in my net metering deal with the utility. Now, I hear you saying, but Mr. Sunshine, you're taking less from the grid. Why so glum? And I say, shut it, shut your stupid face and listen to me. When you convert your DC solar panel electricity into AC power to get it into your house and then turn it immediately back into DC so you can store it into the, uh, in the battery, you're wasting electricity. So let's go through that again. Each time you convert your solar's DC power to AC just to get it into your house, you lose about 3% to heat and evaporated unicorn tears. Every time you convert it from AC back to DC in order to store it in your power wall, which happens almost immediately, you lose about 3% to heat and dried baby seal tears. And every time you convert it back from DC yet again to AC, to use that electricity in your house, you lose, wait for it, another 3% to heat. And you probably also crush the dreams of an entire litter of orphaned polar bear cubs. I hear you saying, Mr. Sunshine, why are you being so negative? You're still doing good by reducing your carbon footprint. To which I say, meh. I mean, that might be true. But the benefit I can derive by saving money and putting that money into more green energy products, like, I mean... I don't know, pearl white Tesla Model X with white interior, six vigging leather seats, kitted with wireless gaming con uh, controllers, full self-driving, and actually, um, you know, all of that is actually going to compound my carbon footprint reduction. If I were just to hoard that solar energy for myself, I'm the only one who benefits. If I share that solar energy and get the net metering credit for it, someone else's carbon footprint is lowered and 
I get to use those extra resources to further reduce my carbon footprint in other ways and be the cool kid with Model X. Now let's pull up the spreadsheet. I've got, um, our spreadsheet, which shows this chart here is our actual consumption over a year, but there's something I want to show you. It's even worse than what I, what just described, uh, than what I just described. Not only am I losing 3% in three conversions for a total loss of 9%, I lose another 3% a day to vampire drain from the battery. And what am I doing to make up this 12% loss in electricity? I'm buying more electricity from the grid. It's insidious. If we get, if we game that whole thing out over the life of the system, you can see here we have the system chart. And if we compare this directly with uh, the chart showing our um, conversion loss, you can see that it pushes out the payback period by about two years. Now, looking at the total do dollars lost, we have that in the system, the full system numbers here. I show the full amount lost, uh, which it, you know ranges between ten and thirteen thousand um, dollars. You know, for the three scenarios I have charted here, that's you know a, a conservative estimate. Um, an average estimate and an aggressive estimate. So I took a conservative estimate, uh, an aggressive estimate, and then I averaged them together just so we get an idea of what the two scenarios could be, right? So for that ten to $13,000 between the three scenarios that we lose, we decrease the amount of electricity we send to the grid. We don't make up for that decrease in storage due to the conversion loss and vampire drain. So now hopefully you can see why I was being a dummy. Anyway, Randy, congratulations on your upcoming Tesla solar glass roof install. I hope your system is installed soon and that the process is a pleasure all the way through. Um, others looking to contribute, honestly, leave a comment. Call 203-816-5150 or email teslapowerpodcast.com. Join the conversation. And now, news, anyone? Australia has been ahead of the adoption curve for battery storage. Th this whole thing has been out of necessity as the grid had been destabilized in a storm that took out transmission lines supplying the grid in 2016. This is mostly for the southern part of Australia. Now, solarquotes.com.au has an excellent article they published this week that aggregates a lot of what they have learned about how to get the best value out of a battery storage system in Australia. They deep dive on how to use time of use to reduce your payback period and maximize the total value owners can expect from their battery storage systems based on jurisdiction. And the rest of us can benefit from general principles outlined in these articles or in this article specifically. So they introduced the article by pointing out uh, quote, if you have a home battery, a time of use tariff can save you money. How much depends on one battery compatibility. This includes usable storage capacity, power output and flexibility Two, location time of use tariffs vary greatly from state to state to a lesser degree. They can vary within states and three electricity consumption habits and solar electricity production. And then four, whether or not you're part of a VPP, that's a virtual power plant that allows time of use tariffs. Now, they do a great job of explaining how the tariffs for consumption can be offset by the lack of solar credit when you send your electricity back. So that's the difference between whether you use it yourself or send it back to the grid. And that gives a more realistic estimate of the savings that, that are possible from these systems. And they point out on the order of $1,200 Australian per year that can be saved. Now, my favorite part, though, is the section called there's no such thing as a magic, magic battery. Let me go full screen and scroll down to it. There's no such thing as a magic battery. True enough. And what's the number one reason? Efficiency losses right here at the top. Wham! And their number on these efficiency losses 
Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Oh, I want to highlight it because it makes me look great. It's 12%. Yeah, yeah. Installing a home battery. Yeah, 88% round trip efficiency. Yeah, there it is. In real life, a Tesla Powerwall 2 has a round trip efficiency of about 88%. So that means I was exactly right about what I was ranting about earlier. It's the exact same efficiency losses. Now, come on, bro. I got tiger blood. I'm winning. They wrapped the article with a comparison between the savings for time of use which we don't have here in Connecticut uh, and conclude that time of use is the clear winner with three times the saving over a full year. They've got a nice little chart here right here at the end that shows the, um, you know, the arbitrage difference between the two. Now that wraps the new segment this week. Let's clear up what uh, pure stands for and reveal some detail on why the single power wall addition makes so much difference to our utility. So I was looking directly at the title on the last video and I couldn't read Pura's acronym. It's Public Utilities Regulatory Authority. So Hooked on Phonics worked for a lot of people, not for me. The regulatory authority is tasked with defining the responsibilities of the utility and energy suppliers in the state of Connecticut. So they're not just looking after one side, they're looking after both sides of this transaction. Now, after about a hundred years, they've been regulating you know, much more traditional or I guess for the past hundred years, they've been um, regulating much more traditional types of, elect uh, of electricity suppliers like oil, gas, and coal power generators. Most of these were large power plants. In fact, we've got a coal power plant down the street, um, but some were smaller sources and have, you know, over time, they've started to include renewable resources, of course, right? So over the last decade, things have, uh, you know, really been changing fast with the growth of residential solar as energy suppliers to the grid. And this, you know, is part of their incentive package. You know, they're putting money into this and trying to convince homeowners to, to make the conversion. So this isn't by accident, but these regulations were, were written right at the beginning of this uh, initiative. So 20 years ago, you know, when this trend, trend was brand new, Pura set the threshold for quick connect, uh, quick connect and quick approval for residential solar energy suppliers at 20 kilowatt hours. Now at the time, I mean, this was seen as a clear line between what a residential size uh, supplier and a commercial size supplier would be. I mean, a 20 kilowatt system would be, you know, at the time, you know, practically unfeasible for any homeowner to install for two reasons. You know, both it would have been, you know, stupid expensive and because it would have required the system to take up acres of land. Now, of course, 20 years later, not only are solar systems a bazillion times cheaper, they're also way more efficient and take up way less space. It now makes it possible and a lot more probable that residential solar installations might top this 20 kilowatt hour uh, threshold. But there's a twist. In an effort to make this simple to calculate, the regulation was written to add the total rated capacity of all the AC inverters included in the installation. No one saw AC coupled batteries as a thing not 20 years ago. And of course, each power wall includes an AC inverter. So now those capacities need to be added to the total for determining the compliance to the Pura regulation. So our system includes two string inverters. One is seven kilowatts. The other is 3.8 kilowatts. Uh, our system includes two power walls. Each is five kilowatts for a subtotal of 10. So let's add them. Seven plus 3.8 plus five plus five equals 20.8. That means our installed inverter capacity exceeds the pure regulatory limit for a residential permit by less than a kilowatt. <laughs> and even more painful, if we had the Powerwall Plus, we wouldn't have run into this issue. Why? Because the Powerwall Plus is stacked with the inverter. We wouldn't essentially be doubling up on the inverted AC capacity. We'd only have the seven kilowatt rated capacity on each of the two inverters that would be paired with the Powerwall Plus. So Powerwall Plus, uh, let's get some of that detail up here actually. And we'll go full screen with it. Uh, if we look at the AC inverter capacity, uh, we can see each has a max continuous power on grid output of 7.6 kilowatts. And that's showing right here, maximum continuous power on grid 
five kilowatt input. We don't care so much about that. Um, although that does matter because that's going to um, uh, matter for pulling power from the grid. Uh, but this is our rated output to um, the grid that the utility is going to take into account. So 7.6 kilowatts. Um, and since we would have two power walls, we would double that and we would be at 15.2 kilowatt and well within the 20 kilowatt regulatory limit. limit. <laughs> this has nothing to do, incidentally, with the installed solar capacity, by the way. Right. The thinking there is that if you don't have the inverter capacity, then they'll let you, you know, upgrade your system. You know, they'll let you add capacity to your generating system without having to repit, uh, repermit with the energy supplier, or re <laughs> repermit the energy supplier, which would be the homeowner in this instance. So, uh, we only have thirteen and a half kilowatts of solar capacity installed, but that doesn't matter. Our batteries are not able to output that to the grid. I'm not quite saying that right. So the 13 and a half um, kilowatt solar array, first of all, won't be that efficient. We won't ever be, you know, pro um, generating 13 and a half kilowatts at the same time. But those going through the inverters, right, can't generate 13 and a half. We only have, um, um, what's uh, seven plus 3.8. So that's 10.8 kilowatts of capacity to send out to the grid with our inverters. So even if our panels were generating at hundred percent, it would throttle it back to that capacity that it could send out to the grid. So what matters is that Tesla could change a setting on the gateway that would allow us to send um, our batteries though, back to the grid. So it's not just about our solar capacity and it's just a settings change in the uh, solar gateway. So um, if they decide that they're gonna change the regulation and we are able to start participating in a virtual power plant to supply demand response power to the grid, then they just change that setting and voila, we're in business. We'd potentially be sending, you know, 23 and a half kilowatts to the grid at any given moment. That's from the two inverters and the two batteries. Now, this isn't practically true. Number one, it's unlikely that the solar system would ever be producing at 100%, like I mentioned before. And the fact is revealed in the string inverter capacity, as I pointed out a minute ago, we only have capacity to handle 10.8 kilowatts of energy coming from that solar glass roof. So you'll remember one string inverter, it's rated at seven kilowatts. The other one is rated at 3.8 kilowatts. And we're back to why Pure only cares about the sum of the rated inverter capacity. So it's the practical limit of the amount of power that we can be putting out to the grid. Yeah, I mean, not just the practical limit, it's the theoretical limit. Um, we, we just cannot exceed that. Uh, the rated capacity that's written on those inverters. So all of this is in service of the greater good, the greater good. Balancing load with supply is critical for maintaining a sta stable grid. And if you haven't already stumbled on this channel, Practical Engineering uh, on YouTube, Grady has a great series on the grid and covers some grid failures, including the recent Texas grid failure uh, in February, 2021, earlier this year. I put a card up and a link below. The videos are bite-sized and they really helped me understand what's required and why battery storage is such an important part of a modern stable grid. So no more news for now. Uh, things are picking up though. I mean, we've been getting a uh, you know, higher pace of videos out and there's been a lot more to talk about in the, the, you know, the world of, of Tesla home energy and it's only gonna get faster paced. So I'm pretty pumped. That Tesla energy is starting to make some moves. It's been slow. Uh, to become profitable, but I think their product offering is damn good. And comment below if you agree, or maybe you see some better products out there. We need to be talking about them. And that wraps up episode 14 of the Tesla Power Podcast, the unofficial energy community. I'm Aaron Brady. My referral code is ts.la slash Aaron62310. And if you place your order there, you'll save a few bucks or you'll get some free supercharging. Now, don't forget, 10 of those referrals will score a 4680 Powerwall Plus and some subsequent content for you. I've also put the link in the description. Let's do this again on the next video.